Can I first begin by acknowledging um, the Lord Mayor? It does feel like he's the Mayor of South Australia sometimes because we, <laughs> we, we do so many things together. And um, in, in a very real sense, um, South Australia uh, is very much dictated, the, the fate of South Australia is dictated in, in large measure by uh, the image that we can present of our capital city. It is the arrowhead for the rest of South Australia. And um, I think I want all South Australians to be proud of our capital city as a projector of cultural capital around the world. Uh, can I also acknowledge um, the presence here of Ron Bush? Thank you very much, uh, Dr Bush, for that, that wonderful presentation. It's great to see you back in South Australia. We're very proud of our relationship with Siemens. Um, when I signed a memorandum of understanding with Siemens uh, back in 2012, um, I had the opportunity to discuss with a range of the, the international representatives that, that came to that, uh, that important ceremony in London about the, uh, the way in which uh, Siemens saw its place in the world. And it, it, it discussed uh, a business that was, um, uh, had, a, I think, a very interesting mission. Uh, one of the really interesting things that, about its mission is, is democracy. It had a very strong commitment to democracy and to the discussion of ideas. I think it's fitting that Siemens is a partner with us today, uh, together with CEDA, which is another great institution which helps us debate and discuss ideas, uh, these important ideas about the future of our cities uh, and our state. I also want to acknowledge uh, Professor Colin Sterling. Flinders University made a very big decision to come down uh, from the hill, uh, down to Tonsley, uh, and um, uh, by shifting its uh, very important part of its uh, campus down here to the Tonsley site, it made a critical and important investment decision, which is absolutely at the heart of the success of this innovation district. Um, there's, not a, there's not an element of our economic plan for South Australia that I can look at that doesn't involve our tertiary sector, our university sector, our further education sector. And you've just seen the elements of successful innovation precincts. They involve collaboration. They involve collaboration between tertiary institutions, businesses, the broader community as they seek to uh, meet the challenges that we face. So it's wonderful that we have a partner in the Flinders University and thank you for hosting this event. Can I also um, begin by just um, repeating something that uh, has been observed uh, by uh, Terry about this place. <coughs> we um, made a big decision when we decided to buy this as a state government. Um, as Terry said, it could have been uh, repurposed for some other use. Relatively low value, and certainly something that didn't speak to the future, in our view, uh, of uh, the transformation of the South Australian economy. But to take an, an old car manufacturing plant and repurpose it as an innovation precinct um, was more important than just the things that were going on here. It was also uh, the vision that it sought to express to the people of South Australia. This have, could, could have been an icon to a failed industry, or it could be, as it is today, a beacon of what the future should look like. And obviously we chose the latter, because we wanted to send a message that we are transforming the South Australian economy. And, we, and this has now become the iconic um, image of South Australia's transformation of our economy. Sustainability. Uh, looking at all of those megatrends, understanding that we're going to live in a carbon-constrained environment and wanting to, to actually be part of uh, coming up with the solutions that are going to permit us to conquer that challenge. Looking at the, the great trends that we know that are occurring in our demo demography, which is an ageing population, and with that, the demand for, for new and improved medical technologies, and having this to be a place which is a centre of innovation in relation to medical technology. Uh, and all of those things happening here in this place, where clever people get together with businesses 
come together to imagine the new ideas, create the new businesses of the future. So this is a very important place and it's wonderful that we're having this discussion in this place. So um, the South Australian Government um, is very proud to be here uh, and we're also particularly uh, proud to be welcoming the, uh, the presentation today uh, from Siemens of the Siemens City Performance Assessment Report. This is a compelling and valuable piece of independent research which goes to the heart of a, a topic that to both the Lord Mayor and myself are working on for the future of our city and state, and that is our joint commitment to make South Australia, and in particular, uh, the capital city of Adelaide, a leader in our response to a carbon-constrained future. And we've chosen together to commit ourselves to make Adelaide uh, the world's first carbon-neutral city. Now, it's a big challenge. Uh, there are many people in the race. Uh, but we believe that not only is this important for its own intrinsic benefit of being able to unlock the technologies that are necessary to achieve this, and by doing so become uh, a first mover and therefore the capacity to take those technologies to the world, we also believe that this gives us a capacity to project the values of our state. So the city as a projector of our cultural capital, what we stand for, what it means to be a South Australian, and in that sense, attracting people from around the world to be part of the South Australian story. So this new report uses the Siemens City Performance Tool, which assesses what sort of technology options best fit the city in question in order to cut greenhouse emissions, improve air quality and create jobs. And as uh, has been mentioned, Siemens applied this analytical tool to 11 cities worldwide so far. But as Adelaide is the first city in Australia to have uh, the assessment applied to it. To me, the report tells us that we in Adelaide are broadly on the right track in relation to our efforts to become carbon neutral. But by exploring different scenarios covering energy, buildings and transport, it put forward a series of uh, essentially suggestions which uh, represent a further spur to action and obviously a start of a debate. The document outlines how we can use technologies in the three areas to significantly cut our emissions in the next decade and create many thousands of jobs. And the findings are enlightening. They'll provide uh, important input to the Carbon Neutral Adelaide Action Plan which is currently being developed. We understand that there are choices that can be made here. Uh, some technologies give um, a better result in terms of carbon intensity. Uh, other technologies give a better result in relation to the job creation. Others are more expensive. These are all things that need to be weighed and balanced. Others have, if you apply a broader public value test, other have, others have collateral uh, benefits. For instance, the introduction of public transport to your city can reduce uh, the uh, not only the uh, emissions, but also uh, the, uh, the experience in the city. The, the urban amenity can be approved uh, associated with the reduction in noise level, the reduction in fumes and emissions. Uh, and, uh, of course, it uh, just adds to the general attractiveness of your city, and that has its own benefits, which, uh, which are some, somewhat intangible, but, but certainly add to the livability of our city. So the report uh, does identify key strengths and opportunities behind Adelaide's technology choices, and I want to touch on some of them now. The first one, that coordinated action by the city and the state can yield to deep cuts in emissions. That's something that uh, we endorse and we're demonstrating by the way in which the Adelaide City Council and the state government are working in concert. Uh, we found when we went to Paris that it's not necessarily commonplace for regional governments and city governments to cooperate. In fact, it's not even always um, uh, commonplace for them to like each other. Uh, so th we do have, uh, fortunately, we do like each other. So it is, th this is an important starting point uh, for us, that the collaboration between city and state. Um, we are working together on a range of uh, fronts. For example, we're increasing the demand for renewable energy. We're boosting green industries 
we're boosting resource efficiency and we're improving waste management and of course we're moving to cleaner modes of transport. Among other things, the plan will make hybrid or electric cars the preferred mode of transport in the CBD and together we're showing leadership in that regard. This is highlighted by the fact that this is one of the few places in the world uh, where we've signed up to interrelated international climate change agreements. In the broadest sense, um, we are, what we're doing uh, as a city and a state is making sure that the carbon neutral city is yielding benefits um, which are integrated to our policy work on a number of fronts. Um, it complements uh, the principles being undertaken in the 30-year plan for Adelaide, a draft of which was released by the Minister for Planning last week. And of course, it promotes our economic priorities, uh, which, um, amongst other things, are about unlocking the full potential of South Australia's um, renewable energy assets, growth through innovation, and of course, the city uh, as the heart of our vibrant state. Our efforts in the past 10 to 15 years in the renewable energy area mean that today about 41% of the state's electricity is generated from sources such as wind and solar. And we've set a target to make that proportion 50% by 2025. Ultimately, as you see from the graph uh, there, we, we all need as a, uh, as a world to reach zero net emissions. We're proposing this for our state by 2050. And we've demonstrated that you can cut emissions and at the same time still grow your economy. Those two things are not mutually exclusive. Between 1990 and 2014, South Australia reduced its emissions by 8%, yet over the same period, we increased the size of our economy by 60%. So South Australia has decoupled economic growth from carbon emissions. What the Siemens report is urging is that coordinated action by governments, not just by cities and states, but also by federal governments, are crucial. And this imperative was highlighted just yesterday with the release of a new report by the Climate Change Authority. That document recommends a series of things Australia should do to deliver on its commitments flowing from last year's United Nations COP21 summit in Paris. We in the state government um, support a number of its recommendations, uh, including uh, a recommendation that we have already been promoting on a national basis. Just a fortnight ago, um, the Energy Minister was at the National Energy Minister's meeting in Canberra, promoting uh, the suggestion of an emissions intensity scheme to be introduced in the electricity sector. This would shift the relative price of uh, coal-fired generation to gas-fired generation and have a dr make a dramatic difference to reducing carbon emissions across the whole of the southern electricity market and most importantly would stabilise the system such that we can play more renewable energy into uh, our system. Now South Australia is blessed with wonderful renewable energy assets, solar and wind, uh, but we're generating clean, green, low-cost energy but it doesn't find a home. It can't go into a national electricity market which has not been designed for this purpose. So this represents an incredibly important area of public policy reform. And unfortunately, the whole question of, of putting a, a price on carbon has become highly politicised. It's been at the fulcrum of uh, you know, the destruction of the political leadership of Malcolm Turnbull and uh, Kevin Rudd and then Tony Abbott and then Malcolm Turnbull is back again. It's an extraordinarily divisive political issue, but it's a relatively simple device, one where, where, which we found in Paris there was an international consensus about simply putting a price on carbon because that is the only way in which you're going to get a technology agnostic and efficient response to dealing with uh, the challenge of climate change. The international community has moved on. Most business people in, in uh, uh, the, the serious business houses in Australia, especially financiers, are already pricing the notion of a carbon price into their long-term thinking. And so politics just needs to catch up with the reality of the world. Uh, and ultimately, uh, South Australia, as a first mover in this area, will be indicated. And we stand ready to reap the benefits of being a first mover. 
So um, this, the second interesting finding in the Siemens report is that Adelaide should decide whether to focus on public transport or cleaner cars or both. And we like to do work on all of these fronts. In line with this, the state government is implementing a plan to expand and improve the public transport system, including the electrification of certain train lines. You've already seen the electrification of the Southern Line, and we have plans to ex uh, electrify the Gawler Line, which is already partly completed. Uh, and in the last budget, we extended the city tram network along North Terrace down to the old Royal Adelaide Hospital site. And when it comes to cars, we're actively pursuing this uh, in a number of areas of endeavour. South Australia is fast becoming an international centre for the next wave of automotive uh, technology <coughs> innovation, including driverless vehicles. And an area of our direct responsibility, state government is significantly boosting the use of low emission vehicles. In July, we announced the proportion of such vehicles in the state government fleet will be increased by 30% in the next three years. We we'll see a number of low emission vehicles rising from 161 to 2,000. The third finding in the Siemens report I want to discuss is the one relating to the decarbonisation of commercial buildings. The first scenario explored reveals that our city can reduce its building related emissions by more than 15% by focusing on just five building technologies. The second scenario finds those same technologies can bring about more than 60% of reductions if they're combined with heavier levels of investment to further clean the energy mix. Either way you look at it, the commercial sector remains the largest source of emissions in the City of Adelaide, so it's potentially the most fruitful area of action. The State Government has recognised this potential by introducing a scheme designed to make a practical and measurable difference. In Tuesday last week, I attended an event at the Convention Centre in which we foreshadowed the arrival early next year of the building upgrade finance in a, in a, uh, innovative uh, scheme. That program meets the government's 2014 election commitment to set up a mechanism to help owners overcome financial barriers to make their buildings more energy and water efficient. In simple terms, the scheme makes it easier for building owners to obtain private finance for upgrades and on better terms than traditional finance. Um, it promises benefits for building owners, tenants and companies carrying out the retrofitting of buildings and for local councils. Building upgrade finance can go towards work on all kinds of commercial and industrial properties, not only city office towers. It could be used for places like Tonsley, where we have buildings that were part of the Mitsubishi car assembly site. And there are few limits on the type of work that could be undertaken with the assistance of building upgrade finance. For instance, it could include large-scale solar, LED lighting, waste management systems, facade treatments, or energy storage. And anyone here that thinks they can take advantage of the scheme, especially if you're a building owner, I recommend you talk to the local office of the Property Council of Australia, which is heavily involved in its imminent introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, in addressing today's topic, mapping the journey to a CO2-free future, um, I think the single most important thing that emerges from this is an acknowledgement of uh, what is a future reality, that is that we exist in a carbon constrained environment. There are two ways in which we can approach that. Either we can uh, see that as a threat uh, and shrink from it, or we can see it as an opportunity and apply our minds creatively to the opportunities that it creates uh, for our businesses for our communities and for our state. We've obviously chosen to meet this head on and to apply ourselves creatively. There is no better example of a place that brings together all of the elements of creativity than this Tonsley precinct. Students, businesses, our further education sector, um, our universities, and of course, a local population that's going to be living working, playing on this very site. Uh, this, this represents uh, a magnificent example of how we can lead the world in responding um, using what has always been that great South Australian trade, our capacity to apply our industriousness, to carve out an existence for ourselves in a relatively harsh environment where we don't have some of the natural advantages of the large population centres. This has been at the heart of South Australia's DNA, our creativity, and we can use that 
to create a new future for ourselves and our families. Thank you.